Hello, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Glad you could join us today for our session on building works our applications with AWS. Uh, as the last people are seated, my name's Simon Alicia. I'm Principal Solution Architect here at Amazon and I'm thrilled to be here with you. Joining me today will be James Hamilton, who for many of you will need no introduction. He'll be uh, coming on a bit later in the talk and, and contributing it as well. And uh, I'd also like at this point to, uh, to recognise Mark Ryland, one of the uh, leaders of our um, public sector team, uh, the Solution Architecture team, who this was his idea, this presentation, and certainly contributed a lot of the content. So I wanted to give a shout out to Mark there as well. Now, I've been working in IT for about 22 years now. Um, I know I look so young, but you know, I carry it well. And I started off as a mainframe programmer. Kix, COBOL, DB2, I'm good with that. And in fact, that's my retirement plan in another 20 years as well, because I figure, who's going to know that stuff? And there'll be systems lying around with that stuff there. But you know, when you're developing systems in-house for a predictable audience, there's kind of a set of criteria you work to, and that's what you work to. But in the web world, things grow really rapidly and scale unpredictably. And personally, I had a bit of a taste of this early on in my career. Back in 95, I uh, designed the, um, the passenger movement system for Australia. So this is the thing that when you come to Australia, you give your passport, they check if you're a good enough person to come in, and you go through, and same thing happens when you leave. And you know, I built that system, and it was designed at the time to handle about 20 million movements a year. It now handles about 30 million movements a year. It had seasonal workloads. It was widely distributed across states and territories and ships and all that sort of stuff. But essentially, we knew kind of what that traffic profile would look like. In the web world, you have no control. You don't know where the traffic is coming from. You don't always know why it's coming. You may have some predictions that you think you've made correctly. But you're kind of working a little bit in the dark. And it's a bit of a challenge. So I want to reprise a bit of a challenge that we spoke about this morning in the keynote as we lead into this. Think about eight months of travel. Think about going hell for leather for eight months in one direction. You can do a lot in eight months. You can almost have a baby in eight months. Some people do. They go a bit early. It happens. You know. Think of seven minutes of terror, seven minutes of when you're not sure what's happening, but you want everyone to see what's going on, even though the outcome could be kind of not so good. Think about having hundreds of thousands of people watching this at the same time and knowing that there are no second chances, that this is a historic occasion, it's a one-shot deal, it's like the moon landing, you get one go at it. And of course, this is the Mars Curiosity rover. And like many of you in this room, I sat and watched it live on my machine, I watched the live stream, and I was excited by it, because I'm an engineer, and let's face it, is this not a child engineer's dream? I'm gonna send a rocket to Mars, and I'm gonna have a remote control car that goes onto Mars, but my remote control car will be landed by this really cool rocket thing as well. I mean, you couldn't dream it any bigger. And so, the interesting part of the story here is that you had this unpredictable audience around the world of people with different interests and different reasons for wanting to watch this who needed to see this in real time. And so the architecture that was used at, uh, at NASA JPL allowed them to build highly scalable stacks that were essentially stateless, and we'll talk about that shortly, but essentially were able to deliver the same experience wherever they needed to geographically. They were very large in terms of their scale. They could deliver 25 megabits per second of throughput per stack could be called upon on demand when needed. And what I think is particularly cool is they don't exist anymore because they're not needed anymore. So the experience that we all had was a successful experience, was a rewarding experience, was a, an easy to watch experience, irrespective of what was happening at the back end. Now, when we talk about architecture, I like to make the comparison to an artist. Think about what an artist does. An artist wants to create something that didn't exist before, that other people like, that other people will find uh, interesting to look at, that is born from their experiences, that comes from their knowledge of their craft, their technique, etc. Now, the architect does much the same thing, except we have the added wrinkle of we have business imperatives, we have timelines, we have budget. If anyone doesn't have budget, love to meet you, if you have no budget constraints. And the challenge of being an architect is really, and this is kind of how I define it, is that the solution architect has to make really important decisions in really short time frames, often with insufficient information, and has to usually get it right. That's the challenge that we face. And much like the, the, the artist, we have this palette of tools available to us. But just because we have this palette of tools doesn't mean we can necessarily use them effectively. If you gave me a, a, a palette of oil paints, I can't paint like Picasso. I have no skill in that area. Oops, there we go. And much like if uh, I tried in this next hour to talk to you about all the different schools of art that are out there, Impressionism, Cubism, etc., I'd fail miserably. I'm not going to try and teach you everything about web scale that you could possibly want to know. What I want to do, though, is cover 
a taste of things that maybe will spark some ideas that will give you some food for thought to take away. So firstly, what I want to do is cover the primary colours. I want to cover the fundamentals. This will be familiar to some of you. It should be familiar to all of you. So we're going to cover them for completeness. The first thing is to design for failure, and nothing will appear to fail. And I know when I started architecting systems for the cloud, this was a mind bender for me. Because I came from the golden spanner background of you build things that don't break. And as hard as I tried to build things that don't break, they broke. And as Werner says, everything fails all the time. And let's give the big fella his due. He's right, and he's usually right. And he's right on this one. So what we're trying to have here is a situation where we create the swan. Now, the swan glides gracefully across the pond, looking elegant and graceful, and underneath, the legs are going like crazy, and they don't look particularly good either. But that's kind of what you want for your customers. Customers should not be exposed to any particular failure, and you have to design backwards from there. Loose coupling sets you free. Loose coupling allows you to scale more elegantly and more cost-effectively. It is a very, very important design pattern to create independent boxes that can cope with different decoupled tasks and can offset from one another what they're trying to do, typically using the design pattern of using some type of queue. In this case, we've got the simple queue service. So here I could say I'm bringing in uh, photos to be rendered through controller A, I'm queuing them up, and I don't even turn on controller B until I have 1,000 photos to process, because why would I run the compute if I have no work for me? It might not be cost effective for me to do so. It means I can scale different parts of the architecture independently and more efficiently rather than having the big box that runs out of space or tightly coupled systems that all have to scale at the same time. You need to implement elasticity. Now, elasticity is a fundamental property of the cloud, but there's no point if you don't implement it. So one of the things that has to happen here is you need to use bootstrapping of your instances. And bootstrapping basically means that when an instance starts up, it says, who am I and what is my role? And it's kind of the question that many of us could ask as we're brushing our teeth in the mirror in the morning. Who am I? What is my role? What am I supposed to be doing here? The instances need to come up, configure themselves. Maybe they're a golden image and they're completely already good to go. Maybe they have to go to some repository and grab code and load themselves up. This pattern means that you don't have to worry about failures of nodes, uh, rolling out changes. It gives you a lot of power and a lot of control. It also gives you the elasticity that you want from the cloud. Of course, no discussion would be right without discussing security. Think about security. Think about it all the time, in all elements of your application. You should be encrypting data in flight and at rest that is sensitive today in current systems, irrespective of where they're deployed. If you're deploying things on AWS, then you should be looking very closely at using uh, identity and access management, multi-factor authentication, security groups, virtual private cloud, and all the other capabilities that are available to you. But I also strongly encourage you to think about other attack vectors. Think about SQL injection attack, layer 7 attack, all the other things that can happen to your application. It needs to be a holistic view of security. You shouldn't fear constraints. And again, the, the, the journey and the mind shift that you go through when you start designing in this, in this world is you think, well, maybe if the answer I'm getting is not the answer I want, I'm not asking the question the right way. Maybe instead of saying, I need a box with one terabyte of RAM, I'm really saying, I need an in-memory cluster that gives me one terabyte of RAM that's made up of smaller nodes. Don't fear constraints. Think of a different way to ask the question. Think in parallel. You have access to a vast amount of compute. You want to break up things that you're doing into small chunks and have them operating simultaneously and at the same time. So with S3, you want to be using multi-part upload to get the concurrency going. If you're processing large data sets, using things like Elastic MapReduce can break that up and process it with thousands of nodes. De decompose your components and process them efficiently. And finally, leverage multiple storage options. I've worked in storage for a long time, and I can tell you when all you have is a SAN, everything looks like block storage. Well, the world that we inhabit is not just block storage anymore. If you have objects you need to store, they belong in S3. If you have objects you need to store for a really long time, they belong in Glacier. If you need NoSQL database, you use a bit of DynamoDB. If you need a relational database, you use RDS. If you need high-performance block storage, you use EBS provisioned IOPS. You mix and match the components to solve the problem. You have a whole palette you can choose and select from as and when you need them. 
So that's the basics, that's the primary colours. Let's, uh, let's switch gears a bit and move to some more advanced techniques. And hopefully nothing that bends your mind like this Escher drawing does, but uh, you know, something that will get you thinking. So often when I'm having a conversation with customers, the first thing we say to a customer is, you need to make sure your application is stateless. Use a stateless architecture. Move on. What is a stateless software architecture? A stateless software architecture does not retain any information about the last transaction into the next. So it doesn't keep user data, it doesn't keep logical outcomes or parameters or any other components of that transaction. It's as if it's forgotten all about it. And you're all very familiar with this model of operation because this is how HTTP works. HTTP is a stateless protocol. It works really well because it is a stateless protocol. I'll talk about why that is shortly. But what does statelessness give you? Why would you go to this effort? Statelessness is fundamental to letting you auto-scale in AWS. So auto-scaling is the ability to create rules for tiers of your application to horizontally scale. To say, in this example, I want anything from four nodes to 200 nodes to do my processing based upon the parameters and the rules that I set. Maybe they grow over time, maybe they shrink over time. It doesn't matter because the nodes in this group are all replaceable. None of them has any state, none of them has any more knowledge than the other one does. It doesn't matter if user A connects to node 1 or 10 or 7. It doesn't matter if half of them crash and have to reboot. It doesn't matter. This is an exceptionally powerful technique. And I always point out auto-scaling to people because it's not on the GUI. And people sometimes miss it. It also lets you spread the load. So if we have no state in our nodes, our load balancer can just spread the load to all the nodes as necessary. There's no need for sticky sessions or state management. Now, yes, you can do that, but I can tell you that once you start going down the route of having sticky sessions, you end up building more complexity for yourself that you probably don't want later on. Now, you may say, Simon, this sounds all well and good, but I'm building an application here. It's got a shopping cart. It's going to be really annoying if my user comes in, adds something to the shopping cart, and then the next transaction they do, there's nothing in the shopping cart. That's going to kind of be suboptimal. And I agree with you. So usually some sort of state has to reside somewhere. So where does it go? In some cases it goes you know, in cookies in the browser, particularly small amounts of information or a bit of reference information can go there. We may maintain a session database. We may maintain some sort of in-memory session manager. A lot of languages and, and frameworks include that. And we may also have a framework provided session handler. So um, ASP.NET, for example, provides a really rich set of functionality in this area. It captures pretty much everything you'd want to keep and it manages it for you. But now we've introduced ourselves to a problem, haven't we? Because we need this store of state to be performant. You know, it needs to work really fast because every transaction that I do is going to be using this store of state in some way. It needs to be scalable, because remember, we're building for web scale here. I don't know how big I'm going to get. It had better be able to grow as big as any other component of my system and a bit more. And of course, it needs to be reliable. I need it to be there all the time because I'm storing my state there. That's where my knowledge of my customers is going to be. So where should it reside? State must reside outside of the scope of the things that you wish to scale statelessly. Too often I see people running state stores on their web servers or in their app server. It is the wrong place. It stops you from growing big. You need to have some sort of session state service that is built outside of the scope of those elements you wish to scale. Now you may say, ah, sleight of hand here, Simon. You're doing a bit of a trick here for me because I still have to build this session state and it has to go somewhere and it has to be performant, scalable, and reliable. So what are some of the things I could do to get around that? Well, there's a number of strategies. One is you can just put your state into DynamoDB. Suddenly you have a highly scalable uh, provision throughput solution that has multi-AZ, resilience, and very good low latency. And it's interesting, even I was working on the booth earlier today, I had maybe three customers who came up to me who are already using DynamoDB just for this reason. In fact, there was a, a blog post uh, recently talking about how to integrate the, uh, the, the uh, ASP.NET session state handler directly into DynamoDB. Now, you may not need that level of scale. You may just want to throw it into a MySQL database. You could do that using RDS. Or you may want to roll your own using some of our high I.O. instances for very high throughput and performance. Another common pattern is to wrap all this with some sort of in-memory cache. So Elastic Cache is a good candidate for that. To make sure that you know, maybe all your state just needs to be in memory. 
because you want that performance and maybe it doesn't matter if it doesn't last for long times of persistence or you persist it later. The nice thing is, is that there are many pre-written tools out there that implement this kind of pattern already, but it's not that hard to build. In fact, I'd venture to say with the type of people we have in this very crowded room today, you could turn to one another, take out a sheet of paper, and write the API calls you'd expect to see in a state handling system, and how you'd persist that off to some other location. So state needs to be outside of the scope of the things you wish to scale, and itself needs to be scalable. So what does this buy you, this statelessness of which I speak? It gives you freedom. So this is an online gaming scenario. This is uh, Carlos Conde, one of our uh, very artistically gifted engineers, drew this up, and it's a, it's a great diagram. And you can see here that from the gamer perspective, I come in through my scalable elastic load balancer to my stateless set of web servers that can cater for any amount of load based on auto scale. I'm storing my state in DynamoDB. And then I'm also leveraging some of my other principles, aren't I? I'm using parallelism to process my game database in EMR. I'm also doing things like storing my log files into S3. Using this architect, I can be as successful as I like with my game, or I can be as small as I need to be, cost-effective with my game, and not have to worry about future growth. Now, we've all heard the saying, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. It's important to take this to heart, because retry logic is fundamental to scalable design. Fundamental. But it's not just a case of try, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. If you don't have some sort of back off logic as well, your service will fail. And I'll show you why shortly. It may still break under the weight of the traffic. And you want to use idempotence as a secret source. Now, we'll talk a bit more about idempotence shortly, but just bear that one in mind for me. So without retries, the web as we know it wouldn't work. It assumes everything fails. It's designed for failure, and it works really well because of it. It knows that you know, networks kind of look like that sometimes, and it's not so good. But the interesting thing is, if you consider the difference between a bad network and a failing host, the difference? From the client side, there is no difference. As long as I can retry, reconnect, and, the, and some host is available at some point for me to reconnect to, I don't know if the network was down, I don't know if a router was broken, I don't know if the server's not working properly, I don't know, nor do I need to care. And interestingly enough, this retry concept is now kind of baked into the way our users operate systems. You know, people are really used to refreshing the web page to get the latest scores. They will almost obsessively refresh Twitter to see the latest update. You know, there's this sort of compulsion to it. So the problem that this can cause is things like thundering herds and their ilk. And I'm sure you know that the name thundering herds cannot mean anything good. <laughs> um, basically, this is the concept of saying, well, how do I service a large set of requests all at the same time? And what happens if you know, my service failed or it was a bit degraded for a while and I'm, I'm coming back to life and I'm coming back to fruition, but I've got this pent-up load of transactions that's coming down upon me, I can't recover. And what if lots of customers are just hitting the refresh on the, on the, on the request all the time? This has a cost to you. Because if you consider, you know, you would have seen people who walk up to the elevator and they press the button and they're waiting for the elevator. It's taking a while, so they press it again and again and again and again. Now, the engineer in you knows that pressing that button a number of times makes no difference to how quick the elevator comes. But if they're calling your API multiple times, that has a difference to you in terms of the workload that you're trying to process. So back off logic ensures that the retries do not consolidate into one vicious cycle that will just overflow you and just swamp you with workload. So what's the approach here? One of the approaches is to use an exponential back-off algorithm. And this is one that was provided actually by the SimpleDB team that they recommend using in client-side transactions. And let me break it down for you really simply. Essentially what it's saying is if I try and do a transaction and I'm successful or it's a client-side problem, I'll go deal with that on the client. But if I have a server-based failure, I'm going to back off. I'm going to back off for up to 400 milliseconds. And then I'm going to try again. But if I fail again, I'm going to back off again. And this time I'm going to wait 1,600 milliseconds. I'll try again. And then I'll back off and wait 6,400 milliseconds. But I'm not going to do it so simply as just to say, back off for these finite amounts, because that doesn't help me if I have 100,000 transactions all hitting me at the same time. They back off 400 milliseconds and then hit me again. I'm no better off. What this does is randomizes those retries. So it says, of the, let's say 100,000 transactions that are coming through, maybe I get 1,000 in this particular millisecond, and maybe 1,500 in that millisecond, and maybe only 100 in that millisecond. So I can have a better chance to absorb the workload in a gradual sense. 
This kind of logic is baked deep into a lot of the networking hardware and networking software tiers that we have in the infrastructure we use today. It's important to consider this in your application design. So what about idempotence? Idempotence is your word for the day. It is my gift to you. In the uh, after party later on, you can say, what did you learn? Oh, got me some idempotence. I'm looking pretty good today out of the uh, reInvent conference. And really, idempotence is the property of an operation whereby the effect of it only happens once, irrespective of whether you apply it multiple times. So I can do the same thing multiple times. I'm only going to get the same outcome. And this keeps you safe. Why? Because executing the same thing twice or more times doesn't have any more effect than doing it once. So how would this fit into things? Well, let's use an EC2 example. This is a command to spin up a new EC2 instance. And you'll see there's a parameter there that some of you may not be familiar with, which is client-token. It's kind of broken up over two lines. I apologize for that. And this is a token you can apply to your command, 64-character token. And this says, no matter how many times I run this command in a particular region, I will get one and only one EC2 instance. Interesting. Why would I use this? Well, imagine I'm coding a script. And imagine I made a coding error. Now, I'm the first to admit I may have made one or two coding errors in my career. It's happened very rarely, but it happens. So I've written a, code, a, a script, and my coding error should spin off one instance. But I've got a loop in there, and the loop is malformed, and I've ended up with five calls to this command. If I don't have an idempotent call, I end up with five instances. I probably don't want that. If I rerun the script, I've now got 10 instances. I'm in a world of hurt. Using this type of model, I know that no matter what I do, I'll get one instance. So I'm making the call. I'm getting one outcome all the time. Item potence, very important to consider. So if we're talking about distributed systems, we couldn't discuss it without talking about CAP theorem. And CAP theorem was proposed by Eric Brewer about the year 2000, but it's based on work that happened a long time earlier and was a sort of culmination of a thought process around distributed systems. And it basically looks at these kinds of systems and says, well, there are these three attributes that we're trying to balance here. We've got consistency. So this means that the nodes in the distributed system all see the same copy of data at the same time. We've got availability, which means that I can hit any node and apply, typically an update is kind of how we define it. I can apply an update on any node that I want any time. And I've got partition tolerance, which means if nodes in the distributed system can't speak to one another across the network, everything still works as designed. So the traditional view is that if you have these three things in your system, I'll also be meeting your unicorn that you have uh, in the backyard as well, because this does not exist. That's kind of the, the fundamentals of it, if you like. Now, let me give you some examples just to, to crystallize that thought process. So a synchronously replicated database is a good example of something that is consistent and available, but it doesn't like partitions at all. It won't work properly in a partition state. Whereas a read-only storage system is a great example of being consistent, because all the nodes can always see the data and can tolerate partitions, because it's read-only, but you're not going to get an update happening on that system anytime soon. Whereas something like DNS is a multi-master, asynchronous type database where I can always get an update to someone, and it's partition tolerant because they don't need to talk to one another all the time, but it's not going to be consistent. And any of you who have worked with, you know, DNS providers and time to lives and stuff like that know the pain that that can also cause as well. So there are pluses and minuses to all of these things. But one of the things I really like about CAP theorem, and, and any theorem where the originator of the theorem goes back and revises their work, is that Eric Brewer has done just this. And it's a great article. I've got the link down the bottom there. Where he goes back and looks at this theory 12 years later to clarify a few things. And I think it's important to consider this in your own design. It's not choose two out of three. It's not. If you know that the concept of a partition is rare, why would you sacrifice consistency and availability just to have partition tolerance? You probably shouldn't. Also, cap attributes aren't this binary thing. They're continuous measures, particularly in complicated systems. You'll see an example shortly where it's not a case of saying, here's my system, it has the stamp of cap on it. It's a far more nuanced conversation, a far more detailed conversation around functionality in your application and in your design. So as we said, managing partitions is actually the easy choice of CAP. I know that in general, I'm going to be consistent and available. But I know at times, I may be partitioned. So I will manage that state very carefully and mitigate the states that I know will cause me some trouble. And I'll show you how you can do that shortly. And as I mentioned, it's an operational or a function level decision. Let's use some examples. Think of an automatic telemachine. 
uh, it's partitioned from the network. Can I still withdraw money? Well, yes, I can. Because the bank has a policy that says, you know, Simon, I know where you live. If you take out too much money, I'm just going to come get it from you later on. So I'm happy to give you up to you know, $200 if this particular note is partitioned. Conversely, you want to make a deposit, please go ahead, put it into my safe. I have no trouble accepting money from you in the partition state because it's a managed concept. It's a managed state. The other thing to consider is that latency and the partition decision is your decision as the designer. You choose when that timeout takes place. You choose how much, based on your transactional requirements, you can tolerate in terms of delay of propagation of information before you have to say, I'm now entering the partition state. You have conscious control over that. So use that control. Now, I talked about, well, how do I deal with this sort of partition state? Well, fortunately, in the, back in 89, so predating the whole CAP discussion, Les Lamport and some others came up with this thing called Paxos clusters, which really implement this distributed state machine, ensuring consistency and availability amongst distributed systems, but also giving you a very predictable outcome when you enter the partition state. So it lets you exist in that state and get out of that state in kind of as clean a way as possible. And it uses things like quorum nodes, and that's where the name Paxos came from, which is kind of a mythical Greek island where this quorum concept came up. So it's a really complicated and interesting proof. And I'm not going to try and explain it all to you today, but essentially this gives you a nice design approach to build into your system. Or you can offload it. So maybe you want to get some other system to do this kind of work for you. A great example is DynamoDB. DynamoDB has this concept of conditional rights. And they are idempotent conditional rights as well. So this means that you only update when a condition is met. And you can see the, the little Java code snippet down the bottom here. Basically, it's saying, whenever I go and update my price, I'm going to update it based on another value that I expect to see. So there's an example here. It's a little bit small, so I'll work you through it. I've got client one and client two. Client one wants to go ahead and read item one and get the price, $10. Client two goes ahead and does the same thing. Price is $10. Client one comes in and updates that item and says, the price is now $8. In the meantime, client two has gone to make an update and says, hey, the price is not $10 anymore. I can't do my update. So my client says, I'm going to retry. I'm going to reread that information, present it to the user, and let them make the update again. So I'm not invalidating any information. I'm not suffering from any kind of partitioning in my environment. I'm able to guarantee my update is correct based on the truth that I believed was the case. Very powerful concept, really simple implementation. So let's move on to one of my favorite topics, which is data tier scalability. And it's, it is the bane of the architect's existence. Um, it's no mistake that I've got the, the scream on there. This is where most technical debt in most projects is built up, particularly new projects, I see this. Because you just want to get the database laid out and done, and you want to get on with coding the cool stuff. But the data is the gravity in your system. It's the thing that's going to control what's going to happen to your system in the long term. It's going to cause you the most heartache, the most nightmares, the most scaling challenges. So what do we do? Well, the first approach we can use is what I call the JAWS approach. You remember in the movie Jaws, um, uh, the, the captain, oh, sorry, the, the police officer is there, he's looking at the, the, the jaw, you know, he's at the back of the boat, he's throwing some bait out, and Roy Scheider is sitting there, and Jaws surfaces, and it's this massive shark. He looks at it, and he's kind of backing up, backing up, and he turns to Robert Shaw and says, you're going to need a bigger boat. In many projects, this is what happens. You've got the database, it's running, it's running, traffic's coming in, you're growing, you're growing, and you're looking at each other and going, we're going to need a bigger box. Now, often that's a complicated or expensive decision. Fortunately, in the cloud, not so much. Stop instance, modify instance, start instance. Good to go. Problems with I.O. on the disks, change to provision IOPS, good to go. You can scale up. But at some point, and this is kind of the fundamental rule of IT, no matter how big a box you've got, you'll run out of space. It just happens. And it always happens at the worst time, where you can't get any other alternative. So the JAWS approach gives you so far. Now you can step out of that approach slightly and move to some sort of master-slave horizontal scaling approach. And you can do this very easily with RDS, particularly with the MySQL RDS, where you can create read replicas. So this requires no data schema changes, but slight application change. Basically, you're saying, all my updates will happen to my master node, but all my read traffic will be offloaded to other nodes in the cluster. So depending on the I.O. profile of your application, you can squeeze a lot more life out of this model with very little technical overhead and incurring very little technical debt. But unfortunately, if you're very successful, at some point, depending on your application architecture, 
you're going to run out of horsepower. So this is where we look at sharded horizontal scaling. Now I must warn you, with great power does come great responsibility. This is a more complex, complex and complicated approach, but is exceptionally powerful to allow you to scale. Essentially, this is just one of the models of doing this, is you take your key space and you create what's called a hash ring. You divide your key space up amongst different shards of the environment. Each of these sets of databases, I've used RDS here, it could be anything, represent completely independent sets of data with a subset of the data required for the overall system. And at the application layer, or the hash ring layer, we're allocating where data resides. What does this give us? This gives us virtually limitless scalability, because we can keep growing these databases out. And if we've got a nifty kind of hash ring approach, we can reshard our shards. So let's say a particular one is running a bit hot, it's doing too much work, we can split that up into additional shards as well. Now, you don't get this for free. It can be quite challenging. You need to worry about things like, how do I back things up consistently? How do I do operational maintenance? How do I spin up new shards? This is where things like automation, management, and good operational discipline become really important and critical to how you do things and how you operate. But this is a great approach for getting really, really big. Now, this is a lot easier to do at the start of your project than later on. And certainly we have, I think we have some partners even here today that offer this kind of as a service as an approach later on. It's a good way to dig yourself out of some technical depth, uh, technical debt, I should say, but think about it as you're getting yourself into it. How big do I think I'll grow in my wildest dreams? And I think James has some thoughts about this too that he'll share with us. So you may say, well, I like this horizontal sharding concept, but it sounds like a lot of work. And it is, no, no question about that. So you could use DynamoDB. DynamoDB allows you to provision throughput, and it handles the changing of partitions at the back end across your entire hash key space. So it does that management for you, which is awesome. I've been using it lately for some side projects of mine. Super easy to use, super high performance, great to use, as long as you get your key space right. You need to think about the distribution of your key space so that you can do this sharding in an appropriate fashion. Even though you're not doing it yourself, the system still needs something useful to operate on. This is incredibly important when you have hot and cold data. So maybe you've got uh, daytime tra traffic that's coming in for current orders and then you've got historical data trailing away. You need to come up with an approach that manages that across all of the shards appropriately, all the partitions appropriately. Fortunately, in the documentation, we provide you how to do that. So just bear that in mind. So how do we create a masterpiece for the ages? You know, as architects, we want to build something that people like, that they think is cool to use, that functions well, that's performant, that's elegant. You know, we all get that little nice tingle of satisfaction when we do that, don't we? I mean, you know, when I flew out here a few days ago, I went through that custom system that I designed. It's still working, it's still running, it's still, that's how you get in and out of the country. If you ever come and visit Australia, you'll go through my system. I'm proud of that. You know, it proves it's, it worked. <laughs> you know, it was okay, it hasn't fallen down yet. But how do we go about doing this? Well, firstly, we need to use these techniques and many, many others situationally. You know how I spoke about making decisions carefully and being right a lot and making them with insufficient information? This is the situationally part. Just because you can do horizontal database sharding doesn't mean you necessarily should do horizontal database sharding. Very careful choices have to be made. You need to be aware of the options that are available to you. And I'll give you a little secret. It's not about knowing necessarily the latest and greatest cool techniques from what the cool kids are doing. If you haven't sat down with Donald Knuth's Art of Programming in a while, I recommend you do so. A lot of the problems we face today are solved problems. They were solved 40 years ago. They're just written really complicatedly, but they're solved. And you just go through and you look at them. So there's the new, there's the old, and they need to be brought together under the awareness of what you know as an architect. And People often talk about scaling and how do you scale and what do you scale. To me, scaling can be boiled down to something quite simple. It's the ability to move the bottleneck to the cheapest place or the least expensive part of the architecture so that you can overcome that bottleneck by throwing resource at it because there's no substitute for resource except for coding better. I recommend coding better first, then throw resource at the bottleneck. No, never let that be forgotten. The nice thing is, is that AWS makes this easier for you. You can apply all these techniques really simply in AWS. And one of the, the, the deep senses of satisfaction I get in my role as, as a solution architect is working with customers who start small. They start small and they build something, and it's something that their customers really like. And they grow, and they grow, and they grow, and they grow, and they deal with that growth elegantly and without pain 
and they're excited about their growth. Because I think Werner said it, you know, our customer success is our success. And that is really satisfying as a solution architect to see something grow and not break, but, but grow into itself elegantly in advance. Now, with that, I'd like to pass over to James Hamilton. James Hamilton is our vice president and distinguished engineer. A man who needs, needs very little introduction, but has obviously been instrumental in the design of many highly scalable systems, both at Amazon and elsewhere. James, please join us. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Wow. We're all really lucky because you know, I've been doing this for 20-something years. Our industry goes through periods of slow change. And right now, we're on fire. We're all involved with cloud computing. It is day one. Things are changing phenomenally fast. It's very seldom you get an opportunity to be involved with something that's going to have this kind of a lasting impact. I think it's going to be super cool to be looking back 10 years from now and said I was at that first conference. So I helped build some of those early systems. I feel particularly lucky because I've, I've got a pretty cool job where I'm helping to create some of our new systems, and I, that's where I spend a lot of my time. Where I spend some of my time is kind of in a policeman role where people come to me and say, James, you know all that advice you just got from Simon? Yeah. Well, I'm not going to do it on this particular system because it doesn't actually apply to me because you know, it's happening, we're under you know, scheduled deadlines, but don't worry, we're, you know, th this is what we're going to do to deal with it. And because over time you develop scars, and when you're early on, you, you tend to think you're very confident and you don't need to do these things. What happens is, it's not lack of knowledge of these things that hurt systems. It's, it's lack of implementation of these things that, that hurt systems. And so what I thought I would give you today is kind of a David Letterman short time. So instead of top 10 lists, I'll give you a top five list to a postmortem. Unfortunately, I've been in a lot of postmortems because I've been involved with systems that have had the occasional issue. And each one of those issue is a lesson. And each one of those lessons makes you more valuable as an engineer. And it makes your systems more reliable. And probably the reason why people ask me, can I do this, is I'm likely to tell them no. Let's give you the top five ways to get to a postmortem. These are the mistakes the people that are, people come to me with. Number five, we'll add monitoring and alerting later. We just need to get a production baseline. So we'll get the product out there. We'll get the service running. We'll learn where, you know, what the right baseline actually is. Then we'll have metrics, and we'll go from there. No. The reason why that is absolutely deadly is one of our fundamental advantages of how we run systems in AWS, and what I urge you to do as well, is every week our general managers, vice presidents, and senior vice presidents look at every metric in insane detail. We spend a half day looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of metrics. Every metric is tracked on a five minute or even a one minute granularity. We don't look at the average because the average performance of S3 in the last three years has been awesome. It's huge. S3 is unbelievably big, and so the average is always going to be good. They will never have a bad day. What we look at is the high nine outlier. And the goal is we want to understand if, if a customer has a bad day, it better show up in our metrics. So there's no way we're going live without those metrics, because what that does is it puts us in a situation where we're blind. And more than anything, visibility into what your customers are experiencing is the most important thing. So no. We don't need incremental deployment in V1. What's incremental deployment? That's when you get a software system out there. You don't need it in V1, because you can, just put it, you can deploy the software once. Nobody's running. No big deal. And so we don't need to put it out in the first release. What incremental deployment is, it's what allows you to, to put out just one server in the fleet running the new software. And why is that important? Well, you can test till you're blue in the face, and we do, but there is, I've always said there's no reality like production. Production is where you learn things. That, that is where reality runs. There is no test system of higher fidelity. And so what we do is when we're deploying software, we put it out in one server. We run it for a while. We have lots and lots of metrics. I already told you about that. And we make sure that system's healthy. If it's not healthy, we roll back. If it stays healthy, we'll put it out in another version. Then we'll put it out in three. Then we'll deploy it in an entire availability zone. We won't deploy at the same time across two availability zones. Then we'll deploy in multiple availability zones. We slowly build it up. That's how you roll software out. If you don't have that capability, and I hate to admit it, but we have had times when we've done it that without doing that, it's deadly because you can't upgrade the fleet. The only way to really get the fleet upgraded is someone has to do it by hand. 
And it's a terrible place to be. It's error prone and bad things happen. So, no. We'll get into production and add automated testing later. This is super tempting. We're all under enormous pressure to get our systems released. This is the treadmill that kills teams. This happens all the time. I'm still involved with times when we've done this. I've, I know better. We shouldn't be there. What happens is, it's so, is when you just get the software out, it's, you're in a rush. We want to get customer experience. You don't have a test written yet. The engineering team can run the test. We'll just run them by hand. We'll be fine. What happens is, what is the most educational time in a software release? That's the day you go out. The day you go out, all the metrics come in. You learn everything about your software system. You learn if there are any faults. You get customer requirements. You get feedback on how good it is and what I need and what features you need. What this does is it hamstrings the team. Because anytime you roll a, a version of the software, you have to stop for two weeks to run all the tests manually. It makes the engineer's job terrible. Because everyone hates running boring tests and doing methodical push button work. Everyone hates it. Second thing is, they do terribly. The worst job you can give a small person, a smart person, is a boring job. They will do it job. You can't get it done well. And so it won't be done well. It slows the team down. It means you can't respond quickly to customer requirements. No. This one's super important. It's, it's, this is the one that stops systems from being able to evolve quickly. It's how you lose customers. You get them on board. You don't respond to the requirements fast enough. They go somewhere else. They go on and do their, do their own thing. This is how systems end up not getting traction. And we, we pride ourselves in moving relatively quickly. We thank you for your feedback, and we want to be able to respond quickly. All our test cases are passing. Well, that sounds like a good thing. What's wrong with that? Well, because I've worked for so many years on so many software systems, and I've never seen all the test cases passing. I know you're lying. It's the way they're all passing. This is flat not going to happen. I've never been that lucky in the luckiest day of my life. There's no way. What you mean is all the test cases that are passing are passing. The other ones you factored off onto the side. It's either they're not really passing or you have the world's worst test suite. Anytime someone tells you something that you don't, don't believe, don't believe it. Go dig deeper. There's no way they're all passing. And so what that means every time is people have divided the tests up into two, two groups. The ones that matter and the ones that don't. And sometimes it's related on which ones are passing. Dig deeper. No. Number one, my favorite, I, 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 I admit to you all, I've made this mistake as, as recently as 18 months ago. It is super easy to make, and that is, Simon says use these techniques situationally. Don't. Use this one every time. It's just never let a software system go live with a single relational database at the back end. If you can, Use, a mice, use something like DynamoDB because it just scales by nature. That's a great solution, absolutely, if you can do that. If you need a relational database system, you cannot go live with one system at the back. Well, yes, James, but it, we're, with it, we're only running at 5% load. It will take years to possibly get up to the even point, to the point where we're being close to needing a whole relational database. We hardly use it. What's the risk? Yeah, I guess you're right. Wrong. What happens is, Two things happen. One is, when it comes time to need to shard it, somebody will have written a reporting app that runs against it that can't shard, for sure. If you start it off shardable, the, 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 this is like crack. You, you will use the features of that database, and it will get you, and it will not partition. Everything will be broken when you try to partition. You cannot shard it. So the first one is, it's a lie. You really can't shard it quickly, number one. Number two is, you think you're 10x away because you're only running 5% load. The system's hardly running at all, but you're not. Systems are always nonlinear. You give it a little bit more load, runs a little bit slower. You give it a little bit more load, runs a little bit slower. You give it a little bit more load, and it takes infinitely long. Just suddenly, everything goes nonlinear. That's the way every app I've ever been involved works. And I wish you could fix it. We do everything we can to hunt linearity because that's the way you get reliability out of the systems. But it turns out you need to know where the wall is because when you hit the wall, there's just no coming back. And so what looks like 10x away from the load is not really 10x away from the load. 
it's cracked because you can't possibly, you will build a dependence on it over time. And the last one, this is key, is you don't want one database at the core of your system that will take down every customer. You're going to have a global outage when, not if, when that system won't run. I don't want any system out there without with at least four databases and maybe more because it's not that expensive and there's no way I want a global outage. If I have a global outage, I'll read about it. If I take down 20% of my users, maybe no one knows. 20% of users know. I don't like it, but it is way better than a global outage. Way, way, way better. Getting back from a global outage, you will never get credibility with your customers again. That's just too deadly. There's no way you want to have a single database in there. So the reasons why you can't do this are first, if you do, you, you, you will hit the wall. Number two is you will have a dependency that will make sharding difficult. And if you've ever been in a situation where you've got a system that's been pushed over the wall, it's, it's suffering from a global outage, you found out that you have dependency on non-shardable components, and you're trying to get the code changed as fast as you possibly can, and you've been out for a day and a half so far, it is a terrible way to live. It is so worth avoiding that. So that's... That, that's sort of the number one way, and that, that one I'm totally inflexible. Hey, if you're interested in more, um, tomorrow at 11.30, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to take a bunch of ideas that we learned from systems that run on 10,000 to 100,000 server clusters. These are big, super high scalable systems. These are systems like Search, like Google, Bing. These are systems like Amazon.com. And what I'm going to show you is, is two things. One is, when you go to Amazon.com, it's there. It's always there. When you go to Google, it's always there. The reason it's always there is they've, they've implemented a very small number of very simple ideas. I'm going to show you those simple ideas. Now you say, well, yeah, it's nice for them. They have 100,000 servers, maybe more. I mean, how can I apply it? The cool thing is I'll show you how you can apply those ideas at tiny scale. And that's one of the cool things about AWS is the tools are there such that you can use the same tricks at absolutely microscopic scale and build up over time. So if you're interested in seeing that, I'd love to see you tomorrow at 11.35. Today, what we'd, we'd love to, I mean, we appreciate your time. Um, Simon, come on up here. If you have questions, we'd love to field, to field them. I'm super happy that you're here. So do you have questions for us?